your Bible this evening, if you would, to the book of James, chapter 2. James, chapter 2, please, for our scripture reading. James, chapter 2. We're going to read the first seven verses of James, chapter 2, reading them responsibly as we normally do. Begin together on verse 1, and I'll read 2, and alternating till we end together on verse 7. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 1, James chapter 2. Ready? My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring, in goodly apparel, and there came in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here tonight. And Lord, I thank you for the wonderful singing tonight and the, the music we've enjoyed. Thank you for the good fellowship one with another. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this evening. Father, we ask you that you would uh, continue now to make our hearts ready to receive the truth from your word this evening. Uh, we want to uh, have our hearts in tune with you. We want the Spirit of God to open our understanding. And I pray the, the, the lines of communication would be open between us and thee. And Lord, I pray you'll bless the special to help open those lines of communication up between us and you. Use the special for that purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Needing strength for my journey, I knelt at the cross where Jesus once died for me. And I asked, is this the place where hope abides? And this he said to me, beyond the cross is a tomb that is empty. You won't find me there anymore. And beyond the tomb is life everlasting and hope forevermore. Then I sought reassurance and I went to the tomb, to the place where his body once lay. And I cried, Lord, help me see, is there hope there for me? And this I heard him say, beyond the tomb is a tomb is empty. You won't find me there anymore. And beyond the tomb is life everlasting and hope Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer, and we ask for your help as we come to the preaching of your word. Father, I pray that you will prepare us and open our understanding tonight, that we would grasp the truth that you have for us. 
I thank you for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your word and preserving it for us. I pray, Lord, that each of us tonight, as we listen carefully, would not only hear the word, but we would receive the word with faith. It would be mixed with faith so it would be profitable in our life. And so, Lord, help us to take the word tonight, not as the words of man or the words of a man, but as it is in truth, the words of God. Use it in each one of our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. James 1 is, you know, James is all about our faith in action. And that's what James 1 deals with. And uh, James is one who would say, show me your faith by your works. Don't just talk it, walk it. That's what James would say. Now in chapter 2, he's going to talk about our faith in attitude. He's dealing specifically with people who show partiality. They have respect of persons. They have partiality based on outward appearance. The word there for respect of persons is one that uh, it means to receive their face. Literally, it's you have respect because of who they are, because of the, the face that they have. Uh, you, you, you respect the person depending on their face. If you know them or don't know them, if you respect them or don't respect them, it involves partiality. It involves favoritism. The story is told about a man who was invited to a fancy banquet. He came to the banquet wearing very simple clothes and was told to get out and go to the back door where the kitchen was and ask for a handout. Well, he went home, got dressed up, and went back to the banquet. This time he was admitted and shown to an honored seat. But the guests were all rather startled when the food and the drink came. And he began to pour the drink and pour the food on his coat, saying, eat coat, drink coat. When he asked what he was doing, he said, well, I guess it was the suit invited to the banquet and not me. I came earlier wearing a simple kind of homespun clothing and I was kicked out. But when I returned with my suit, I was invited in. So I can only conclude it was my suit and not me that was invited to the banquet. Now, one thing is for certain, and I want you to look at a couple scriptures with me. We're going to come back to James 2 and go through this passage, but... I want you to understand one of the reasons that God can be dogmatic with us about not being a respecter of persons is because He is not a respecter of persons. Now look at some scriptures with me. Just put something in James 2 there. We'll come back to that. Let's start in 2 Chronicles chapter 19. 2 Chronicles chapter 19. Notice with me verse number 7. The Bible says, Wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. 2 Chronicles 19.7 Let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it. For there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor, what church? Respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. God says, there, there's no respect of persons with the Lord our God. God doesn't, doesn't treat somebody differently just because of their face. Because He recognizes them or does not recognize them. Now I want you to look in the New Testament with me to Acts chapter 10. The book of Acts chapter 10. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Acts 10. Peter preaching to Cornelius and his relatives. And Peter says this in Acts 10, and notice with me verse 34. Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no, what church? Respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. 
He's no respecter of persons. You fear God and you work righteousness, you're accepted with Him. Look at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Right after the book of Acts is the book of Romans. Start with me in verse number 7, will you? The Bible says, To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory, honor, and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also to the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. God treats everyone the same and handles everyone on the same basis. Now, let's go back to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. And I want you to notice here, James tells them in verse number 1, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. So it, it, if I understand this right, God does not have respect of persons. And if we have the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, neither are we to have respect of persons. Okay? That make sense? For if they're coming to you, here's what was taking place. If they're coming to your assembly, a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel. Okay? If you see a guy come in and he's flashing the, the bling. Okay? And he's got a nice expensive suit on. Right away, your first thought is, that guy has some money. He's got some wealth to him. Okay? All right? And then it says, there come in also a poor man in vile raiment. Okay? Another guy who's pretty shabbily dressed. And you're not quite sure whether is this guy homeless? Is this guy want a handout? What's he doing? Is he casing the joint to come back later? You begin to make uh, assumptions in your mind and become partial. Notice what he says happens. Here's what happens. You have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, the expensive clothing, and say to him, Sit thou here in a good place. And you say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? Saying, here's the thing, you're becoming very partial in how you treat people based on their appearance. And let me give you four principles tonight when it comes to not being a respecter of persons. Four principles. Number one is simply this. In Christ, everyone is to be treated equally. In Christ, everyone is to be treated equally. In this case, the rich was shown up to a prominent seat and the poor man was told to stand in the back or even better yet, just, just take a seat but not in the chair, sit on the floor underneath the chair. We'd rather not anyone see you. That's how blatant it was and how wrong it was. Now, let me say this. While he's saying you don't honor the rich and snub the poor, he isn't saying do the opposite. He isn't saying, well, snub the rich and honor the poor. Okay? He's saying either one is wrong. Both are wrong. You treat everybody the same. You treat everybody without partiality and, and, with, and try to treat them equally. What does it mean? You smile at both. You shake hands with both. You welcome them both. You are kind to both. And you see, too often churches fall into this favoritism and want to treat people differently. Oftentimes in churches and, and sadly it was the way in the church I grew up in which was, a, which was a, a wonderful church. But they had, and many churches are like this, had a deacon board and deacon board were mainly godly men. They, by the way, deacons have biblical requirements that they need to meet and those are spiritual requirements. They were good men and solid men and faithful men. And then they had what they called the trustee board. 
And the trustees were the men who ran the church. They made the financial decisions, and the trustees in, their, in this particular case were not, were not deacons. They didn't have any spiritual qualifications. Their, their qualifications were most of them owned their, owned their own business or they had some means of wealth. And therefore, they were chosen to try to run the church. Because they figure they were successful in their business, they, 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 they'd be the kind of guys that ought to run the business of the church. Listen, the men that ought to run the business of the church ought to be spiritual men. Ought to be men that, that love God and know God and, 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 and look to God for wisdom. That's important. Not, I'm not saying that if a fella is wealthy or has business that he wouldn't qualify for that. He certainly could. But the qualification isn't because of his wealth isn't just because he's accumulated some of this world's goods. That's favoritism. Many of the, you'd be surprised sometimes, many of the Christian organizations that you look to or you listen to, if you looked on their board, you wouldn't find a regular guy on there. Not one regular working guy. They're all wealthy people. Many who don't have to work anymore interesting I was doing some research and back underneath the Clinton administration 77 percent of Bill Clinton's cabinet were millionaires all of Barack Obama's cabinet were millionaires in fact his cabinet totaled a net worth of like 1.2 billion with a B now, that's, you think that's, uh, you don't want anyone to talk about Mr. Trump's cabinet. <laughs> he hasn't even got them all filled in yet, and I think they're up around $8 billion. That's, but that's how the world operates. That's how they, that's how they choose who's going to get in these positions oftentimes is who's got the money. And, and that's going to get you where, you, where you're going to go. That's the way the world operates. That's the way the world chooses. That isn't the way God's people operate. It isn't the way God's people choose. Chicago, 1923, the wealthiest men of the world gathered. The president of the largest independent steel company was there, Charles Schwab, who 25 years later died broke. No money. They called him the greatest bear on Wall Street, Jesse Livermore. 25 years later, after 1923, 25 years later, he was dead having committed suicide. The greatest wheat speculator, Arthur Cotton, 25 years later, died insolvent at 65 years of age. The president of the New York Stock Exchange, Richard Whitney, 25 years later, was in Sing Sing Prison. A member of the president's cabinet, Albert Falk, in 1923, 25 years later, had been pardoned from prison and died at home. The president of the Bank of the International Settlements, Leon Fraser, 25 years later, dead of suicide. Head of the world's greatest monopoly, Ivar Kruger, again, 25 years later, at 52 years of age, took his life by suicide. Do you understand, when, when material wealth outweighs spiritual wealth, winning is losing. Winning is losing. I'll, I'm going to tell you something. I, I don't know, again, you take those people in President Trump's cabinet. You take Donald Trump. Everybody's clamoring, you know, how much money does he make and where's his tax returns and all this stuff and how wealthy is he? And, and obviously, he's, he's, he's wealthy in the wor this world's goods. Can I, can, I, can I be dead honest with you? And God knows my heart. I wouldn't trade places with him for anything in the world. I've got riches in Jesus Christ that I wouldn't trade for all the millions or billions in the world. I wouldn't trade the peace I have with God for all the money Bill Gates has. 
I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it. That, I'd be losing out on the deal. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasure where? In heaven. Think about, think about the people who follow Jesus. Fishermen. Children. Suffer little children to come unto me. Forbid them not. Publicans look down upon the tax collectors, prostitutes. Some of the women that ministered to Jesus were not well thought of. When, when Mary came in and, and anointed his feet with the oil and wiped him with the tears and wiped him with her hair, remember the Pharisee says he doesn't know what kind of woman's touching him right now. Common there's a phrase as you read through the Gospels, and it's, it's the common people heard him gladly. Common people. So we find out that everybody in Christ is to be treated equally. Let me, let me say this. The, the ground is all level at the foot of the cross. And, and make sure we understand. It's, it's not that you, you may be somebody big when you go out those doors or you walk into your company on a Monday morning. But when you come through these doors on a Sunday or a Wednesday, you're just brother so-and-so. You may be CEO and boss man and big shot there, and that's okay, but you're just brother so-and-so here. Years ago, years ago, I, I had a fellow in our church, and he was the, they had moved our area, and he was the vice president of the North American operations for the Ramada Inn hotel chain. And a nice guy, young guy. I think he was just in his early 30s. And, and the problem was, Brother Chuck, he wanted to be treated like the vice president of operations of Ramada when he was at church. He wanted to be recognized. He wanted to, to, to have some, you know... Uh, public recognition from time to time for different things he might have done and, and, and that wasn't going to happen. That wasn't going to take place. And so we want to, uh, every, listen, all the grounds level at the foot of the cross. When I first started out in the ministry, we planted a church and the very first person ever got saved was a fellow, he was a convert, his name was Ed Rogers. And he said, Ed Rogers is my name, but they call me Amos. Amos Rogers. When Amos got saved, it was in his side yard, and my wife was with me. Now, she's in nursery tonight, but you can verify the story. Because we were, we were knocking on doors, and, and we were at the house of a Mormon. And she said, I'm not interested in what you want to tell me or what you have to say, but, you know, there's a fellow down here in the corner who lost his wife. Not, not his wife, his mom, not too long ago. And maybe he'd be interested. Maybe you could help him. So we went right down to his house. He came around from the backyard. And we introduced ourselves and told him who we were. And uh, he, he had, I said, I understand your mother passed away not long ago. He said, yeah, that's right. And he had a cigarette. And I never forget. He took the cigarette out of his mouth, Brother Mark. He threw it on the ground and stepped on it. He said, I'm sorry about smoking. It's just a dirty, rotten habit I've got. Wish I could quit. We went ahead and asked him if he knew if he died, he'd go to heaven. He didn't know that. Ask if we could show him how to be saved, and we did, and we went through the plan of salvation. They're in his side yard, standing out in the, in the sunshine. I'm going to ask him if he'd like to receive Christ as Savior. Yes, he would, and uh, wanted to pray and ask the Lord to be his Savior. He dropped to his knees. So I got on my knees. And my wife, I guess, got down on her knees. And we're on our knees in his side yard praying, and he got saved. And, then, and, and here's a guy, just a shirt, bib overalls. That's the kind of guy he was. And I lined him up to come to church that next Sunday, and he came to church, and you know where he came when he sat? When he came to church, he came in and sat around the front row. Around the front row. We had handshaking time. There were only, there were only my two kids, my wife, and uh, two other, and, and a, a, Amos Rogers and another couple there. So there were only, you know, my wife was back in the nursery with my two kids, so it was just four of us out there, but we had handshaking, just like we do now. 
and uh, shook hands. He went and got a drink of water. He came back, and there was water down here, down his shirt. It was all wet, sitting on the front row. Gave the invitation. At the, he didn't have to come forward. He was already on the front row. And I told everybody he got saved and accepted Christ, was making his profession of faith. You know what? Ed Rogers, Amos, gets treated the same way that the vice president of operations of North America for Ramada gets treated when they come to church. We're all level at the foot of the cross. Everyone's equal in Christ Jesus. Amen? That's the way, that's the way it, it, it's to work. All right? Now, notice number two. Let me give you principle number two. God does most of his work through poor people. God does most of his work through poor people. Notice what it says. Verse 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. You know, when Jesus came, he wasn't born into wealth. He was born in a borrowed stable. He had to borrow a boy's lunch to feed 5,000. When he wanted to teach the multitude, he had to borrow somebody's boat. He borrowed a donkey to ride into Jerusalem for his triumphal entry. When he was going to eat the Last Supper with his disciples, he borrowed someone's upper room. He borrowed, he really even borrowed a cross in which he died. Someone else carried it for him. They laid his body in a borrowed tomb. You see, Jesus, we don't have a choice. You didn't have a choice into what family you would be born into. You didn't get to choose that. Jesus did. He had a choice. God made that choice as to where and what family circumstances Jesus would be born. But God says He's chosen the poor of this world rich in faith. Oh, they're poor as the world looks at poor. But they're not poor in the eyes of God because they're rich in what? Faith. Rich in faith. Someone said, the most pathetic people in the world are people who have everything to live for and or live with and nothing to live for. Everything to live with and nothing to live for. It was Peter and John who had to look at the crippled man and say, Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man rose up and walked. The greatest giver in the New Testament held up by Jesus Christ as the example of giving, was a widow lady who put two mites in the collection plate because it was everything she had. When he had to pay the temple tax, he had Peter go out and catch a fish and, and said, when you catch that fish, open up his mouth, there'll be a coin in there and you pay the tax for you and me. You see, hold your finger there in, John, in, in James 2 and look, at, look with me at Mark chapter 4, would you please? Mark chapter 4. Notice, if you will, this is the parable of the sower. Jesus is, it tells the parable and then he explains the parable. He tells them what the wayside, what the people by the wayside were, what the seed was there, and what that took place. Then he talks in verse 16 about the stony ground and verse 17 and what happens with the stony ground. Then notice verse 18. He says, these are they which are sown among the thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Do you see that? The deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in, what do they do? Choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. God says there's so many that get deceived by the riches of this world. And when you get deceived into that race and you get the lust for other things, and that's, that's where we are in America. 
We always want, to, we always want more. And the advertising is pushed at us. To, to, you, you've got this, but you need the new and improved version. You need this, and you've got to have this, and you can't live without this. And so we pile it up, and we fill the garage up, and we get a bigger house, and, and then we get a storage unit, and we have to fill that storage unit up. Who would ever thought that just building a bunch of garages and putting doors and, you know, a lot of them, and people would bring you their stuff and they'd pay you to store it for them? What a country. Who to, who'd have believed that? And our, our house get bigger and bigger and we just get more stuff and more stuff and more stuff. And what happens is, the Bible says, when, when that begins to consume you, you know what it does? It chokes the Word. In other words, people sometimes people say, man, I don't get anything out of the Bible. I'm just not getting anything. Maybe you need to get some stuff out of your life that's choking out the Word of God. You need to, 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 to clear some things out. That's what we dealt with in the 530 class with the spiritual house cleaning. In fact, let me show you the verse that we, we looked at in our 530 class in Acts. Acts chapter, I think it was 19, wasn't it? Acts 19. There in Ephesus, great things are happening. Uh, people are being saved and evil spirits are being cast out. And the Lord Jesus, notice verse 17, it says, This was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And look at this, the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came, confessed, and showed their deeds. And many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. They brought the stuff that, that, that had uh, characterized their past life and things that they were involved with, with false gods and false worship. You know what they did? They brought those things. They, 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 before they burned it, they must have added up the price. And I don't know about you, 50,000 pieces of silver sounds like a lot of money today. I can't imagine how much money it was in that day. And you know what they did? They had a bonfire. They have a yard sale. They didn't have a, uh, they put it on Craigslist. They burned it. They got rid of it. And they cleansed it out of their life. They burned the bridge to the past. And when they got that cleaned out and they said, That's, I'm not about that anymore, look at verse 20. So mightily grew the Word of God and prevailed. Amazing how the Word of God grew in their life when they cleaned out all the clutter that they didn't need in their life. I wonder if there isn't some house cleaning needs to get done at your place so the Word of God can grow mightily in your life. See, God does most of His work through people who are poor in this world but rich in faith. How do you get faith? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Get the word choked out of your life. You don't not, you're not a person of faith. The true riches are not in vaults. The true riches are in heaven. Where, where thieves can't break through and steal and, and nothing will corrupt them. Someone said, I've heard many people sing, I'm satisfied with Jesus, but I've never heard a group of millionaires sing, I'm satisfied with money. God does His work through poor people. Let's go to... James chapter 2 again, and notice principle number 3. Respect of persons is a sin. Respect of persons is a sin. Notice what he says in verse 8. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. What he's saying here is, if you're guilty in one point of the law, then you're guilty of all of the law. Say, well, I'm not an adulterer, and I'm not a murderer, and I'm not an idolater. But if you are a respecter of persons, you are guilty of all that. One point, you're guilty of it all. 
every now and then you re uh, read something that talks about, you know, they, they, they want to get your business as a church as far as who do you want to target. What's your target audience? You know, they say, oh, you're targeting 25 to 45-year-olds with two cars and a home and an income of fifty to 100000 a year. No, there's a word for that in the Bible. It's called respective persons. Say, who should the church be targeting? Anyone with a pulse is who the church should be targeting because they're a soul for whom Christ died. I had a fellow used to go to the Y. I go to Victory Fitness Center now. And um, when I was down at the Y, I had a couple older gentlemen that were there in the morning when I was there, and they live on the uh, south part of Grove City there and some little more exclusive areas, if you know what I mean. And some of you have passed out flyers down that area, I think, for uh, the big day and such. And, and as I was talking to him about coming to the church and inviting him to service and such, he, he said, you know, we, we've thought about coming, but we're just we're not quite sure with your location what kind of people would be there. Yeah. And, and uh, Brother Wallace, it was all I could take. To, to just, really, I just wanted to say, well, you probably wouldn't fit in anyway. I, 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 I didn't say that to him. But, but, you know, he's thinking that, you know, this, uh, you're, well, you're right there by Urban Crest. Those were his words to me. I wanted to say in your point. You know, I, I, I don't understand that. Respect of persons. The truth is, look at Luke 14. Luke 14, what Jesus said. Would you turn there quickly, please? Luke 14. Look what Jesus said in verse 12. Luke 14, verse 12. He said also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed. For they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Wow. I don't know about you, but that, those verses ought to be convicting to us. Because how often when we think about it, making a meal... Do we just want to invite our friends? Are people who we know will invite over? Well, you know, we need to invite them over because they had us over. Hmm? We think that way. Instead of, let's see, who can we invite that could never invite us? That could never ask us back? Let's have them over. Let's, let's take them out for a Sunday dinner. Hmm? Not respect of persons. You see, the royal law, as it says in James 2, that, that if you fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, what's the royal law according to the Scripture? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Why is it a royal law? Because it was the King of kings and the Lord of lords that said it. It was Jesus who said that the second greatest commandment is like unto the first. You love your neighbor as yourself. 1 John 4.20 said, If I can't love a brother who I see, how can I love a God who I haven't seen? And he's saying that you're not going to love a God. You're not going to have love for God who you haven't seen if you don't love a brother who you do see. Royal law is to love one another. In Christ, everybody's treated equally. God has done most of his work through poor people, rich in faith, 
and the respect of persons is a sin. I mean, listen, listen, folks. He's saying it's a sin like adultery is sin. It's a sin like murder is sin. It's a sin like idolatry is sin. You are not to have respect of persons. Number four, fourth principle, last one. We're to treat others in light of the judgment day. We're to treat others in light of the judgment day. Look at verse 12 and 13. So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. God says, this is an amazing statement. God says, if I want mercy in the day of judgment, I need to show mercy now towards others. If I am all judgment and no mercy, God says, that's exactly what I'll be for you. That's an amazing statement. It's, it's right up there with, if you don't forgive other people their trespasses, neither will I forgive your trespasses. That's tough. So understand, you, you say, well, I'll just treat them that way. Who cares? Well, you, you'll care when judgment day comes. You understand, we will give an account for the things done in this body, whether they be good or bad. There will be a day of accounting coming. And in that day, it's interesting, the Lord says, the first will be last and the last will be first. In other words, some people we think are first now, God says they're going to be last then. And some people who we're treating as last now, they're going to be first then. We don't know. So we just better treat everybody the same. We better be kind to everyone and love everyone and help everyone and just be good to everybody and smile at everyone and be welcoming to everyone. Let's not have any partiality. Cesar Milan, a preacher, was invited to a large prominent home. There was to be a musical performed by a young lady. She thrilled the audience with her singing and her playing. When she finished, she stood by the door so the folks filing out could greet her and thank her for her performance. It came his turn and he said, Very lovely, but I wish you would dedicate that talent to the Lord. In fact, he looked at her and said, You're just as much of a sinner as the worst drunkard or harlot. But I'm glad to tell you that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. And she looked at him and said, You, sir, are insulting. And he said, I don't intend to offend you, but I'm trusting the Lord to convict you. And that night, that young woman could not sleep. And she crawled out of her bed at 2 o'clock in the morning and dropped to her knees and asked Christ to be her Savior. And then she sat down at her desk and wrote these words, Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, without one plea, I'm sorry, and waiting not, to rid my soul of one dark blot. To thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. I come. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict and many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come. I come. You see, every person is a soul for whom Christ died. Everybody needs loved. Everybody needs to be treated with the same care and concern. Not, not because of who they are. And not because of who we are. But because of whose we are. And who God is. That makes all the difference in the world.
Hey, let's not be guilty of the sin of being a respecter of persons. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth here this evening. Thank you, Lord, for James and for putting this passage here in, in his book, allowing us to look at it this evening. And Lord, I pray that, that each of us would examine our heart and allow you to examine our heart. That none of us would be a respecter of persons. That we don't treat someone differently because of the way they're dressed or because of the way they look or because of some appearance. But we would look at every individual as a person for whom you died, a person who you love and gave yourself for them. And Lord, I pray that we would be known as a church and as a people that just loves people and seeks to point them to Jesus Christ. Help us not be guilty of the sin of partiality and respecter of persons. And Lord, just take an ordinary group of people, just common, every day, maybe poor in this world's goods, but rich in faith, group of people, and do something mighty through us. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'll finish the prayer in just a moment. wonder how many folks here tonight would say, Preacher, the Spirit of God has spoken to my heart. And, and it could be twofold, you know. You, you may have fought the, the temptation to be partial towards certain people because of the way they looked. And maybe God has smitten your heart tonight about being a respecter of persons. But you may be on the other end and you may feel like you've been the recipient of a respecter of persons. That someone has looked down on you because of the way you look or the way you, uh, your appearance. Maybe you need to ask God to forgive you of that. And maybe ask God to forgive them. Release it. And realize, you know what, we're all level at the foot of the cross. With God, there's no respecter of persons. And thank God for that wonder how many folks here tonight would say, Preacher, the Lord has spoken to my heart this evening. Please pray for me. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Amen. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have your invitation. If God has spoken to your heart tonight, respond to him. Just bow the knee and just say, Lord, thank you for speaking to my heart. Don't allow me to have partiality. Don't allow me to think that I'm better than somebody else or that I'm less than someone else. I'm just, I'm just a child of God striving to please the Savior. That's what we're all trying to do. Father, bless this invitation. Thank you for ministering to our hearts tonight. Lord, level all the ground out here at the foot of the cross and hear the prayer we make during this invitation time. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist plays. And as she plays, Brother Bob will sing. As he sings, God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening. Will you please? Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bid me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as I am and waiting not to read my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot a lamb of god i come i come just as i am the tossed 
about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without, O oh Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as I am poor, wretched, blind, sight rich as healing of the mind. Yea, all I need in thee to find a lamb of God I come, I come. Just as I am thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Go ahead and be seated for a minute, if you would, please. Appreciate your attention this evening, and we're glad to have Jennifer Crabtree coming this evening. Uh, Jennifer's been coming for a few weeks, and uh, last Sunday evening, Mrs. Wallace talked to Jennifer and uh, dealt with her from the Bible, and Jennifer accepted Christ as her Savior. And uh, so we're glad about that. And she's coming tonight for a profession of faith and to get baptized. And so glad about that. You can head right out that way. Oh, excuse me. Jennifer, if you would, and Miss Wallace help get you all set for baptism, and we'll prepare to baptize Jennifer tonight. Isn't that exciting? Well, that's good news, and uh, praise the Lord for that. So we'll go down and get ready to baptize her. And Brother Bob, you lead us in the song. Well, lest anybody's uh, concerned or been watching your phones or whatever, the tornado uh, area has uh, left the area, so we're all good uh, from everything that we've seen. So no worries. Don't be running off. All right. Let's uh, sing a couple uh, uh, specials, a couple favorites. All right. And um, who's got a favorite that uh, they'd like us to sing? Leanne? 246? 246. And then we'll go over to 11. Alan? 246 <clears throat> higher ground let's sing that first together i'm pressing on the upward way new heights i'm reaching every day as i'm onward bound lord plant my feet on higher ground <clears throat> come on and let me stand my faith on heaven's table end a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Amen. Let's go over to 11. Number 11. He is mine. Long before the fall of man, God designed a master plan. <clears throat> on that first, long before the fall of man, God designed a master plan. He exchanged a sinner for the sinless one. Jesus left his throne on high, came to earth to bleed and die. He said, Father, not my will, but thine be done. He Isaac, 244, 244, always nervous about calling on him, hold the fort, all right, oh my comrades, see the signal, <coughs> oh my comrades, see the signal waving in the sky, reinforcements now appearing, victory Oh, the fort, for I am coming, Jesus 
164. There's room at the cross for you. This is a good one. <clears throat> the cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide, and it's grace so free. It's sufficient for me, and deep is its fountain, as wide as a sea. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. I never sing that song without thinking of Paul Lamprex. This is Jennifer Crabtree. And Jennifer, upon a public profession of your faith in Christ as your Savior and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, bearing the likeness of Jesus' death and raised in the likeness of his Amen. And the servant said, Master, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Amen. Emma Jean, one zero two. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. <coughs> Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. This I know. <coughs> Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. <clears throat> yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Let's sing that second verse. When we get to the chorus, only those... 12 and under, sing, all right? Sing that chorus, all you kids, 12 and under, all right? Even those that are asleep, wake them up so they can sing that chorus, all right? Let's sing that second verse together. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gates to open wide. He will wash away my sin, let his little... Let's hear it, kids. Yes. loves me the Bible tells me so let's do that same thing on the third Jesus loves me he will stay <clears throat> thou hast bled and died for me I will henceforth live give it all you got kids yes Very good. Fantastic. Let's all stand together. Let's be dismissed in prayer, and we'll sing our song of dismiss, all right? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for a great night tonight. We're looking forward to uh, the remainder of this week. I pray that you would 
uh, just continue to work in our hearts as we uh, go through this week. And I pray that as we meet folks, as we greet folks, as we work with folks, that, Lord, we would not be a a respecter of persons. Lord, I pray that uh, you would just uh, continue to do a mighty work here at Bible Baptist Church. We thank you for your love and your care. Thank you for the decisions made today. Look forward to uh, what you continue to do in our hearts. In Jesus' precious name we do pray. Amen. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's sing that together. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus. Anywhere and everywhere I go for it's a grand thing to be a soldier in this army here below. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's a best thing I know. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>